You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. For more information, visit studylegalenglish.com. Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host, Louise, and today I've got Jonah Perlin on the show. In this interview, we focus on litigation and Jonah shares some tips about how you can write persuasively, which of course you need to do for court or arbitration. But even if you're not involved in litigation or alternative dispute resolution, then I'm sure being able to persuade someone in English is still helpful for you. Some of you will already know Jonah's name because he runs a podcast called the How I Lawyer podcast. I know some of you listen to it. If you don't, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a great podcast. Jonah is also a professor at Georgetown Law. Yes, just like Professor John Terry Dundon from the previous podcast episode. And Jonah currently teaches legal practice and advanced legal writing. He used to work as a litigator at Williams and Connolly, one of the world's premier litigation firms. He also has some very impressive clerkships under his belt. He clerked for Chief Judge Robert A. Katzman, amongst many others. And so he's got a lot to share with us, my friends. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if you're a member, you can access your benefits over at studylegalenglish.com. If you're not a member, go to studylegalenglish.com forward slash pricing to check out member options. If you do become a member, you'll access resources which are going to really help you get ahead with your legal English. So let's go. So I'm super pleased to be welcoming to the show Professor Jonah Perlin. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Great. I'm very pleased to have you here too. And before we get going, I wanted to ask you, have you done your Wordle today? (laughs) I have done my Wordle today and I will tell you it was very challenging. I was only able to get it on try six. So my wife and I have become very big fans uh, of Wordle the last uh, couple weeks. For listeners who might not, they might not know what Wordle is, I I can try and explain it. It's like a word game where you have to guess a five letter word and you get six tries to do it. And basically it's become really popular because people can share their results without revealing what the word is on social media. And it's a visual kind of share and people can really see the way that you've thought through it just by seeing the visual. Yeah, it's really fun. It's amazing to me that in less than six tries, you can get any five letter word. And the other thing that's amazing, I just saw a law professor who I am friendly with and follow on social media, Ruth Ann Robbins, who's kind of a expert on legal storytelling, just posted an article uh, about how Wordle, how that share that you talked about, that visual share is an example of storytelling that she's going to use in her class because it's completely in emojis. So it has no words or letters. It doesn't tell you what you actually did, but if you're an insider and you understand how Wordle works, those 12 emojis tell a story. And I think that's fascinating as somebody who teaches legal writing. We do that all the time, right? We do that with citations. We do that with other forms of shorthand. It's so cool to be able to tell a story in the smallest possible package. It's amazing. Me and my husband as well, I recently got married. We really love it. And so for listeners, I absolutely recommend you check it out. Absolutely. Do it. Wordle could be very good for your English. And another thing I wanted to ask you, because obviously we're doing this interview online and you're, I guess you're in Washington, DC, is that correct? Yes. Yes. I'm in Washington, DC. I wanted to ask, do you have a view outside your window? What can you (laughs) see? Do you have a window in the room? (laughs) I love that question. I do. I'm so lucky to have a window in the room that I have spent Uh, far more time in than I had planned over the last, whatever it is, 22 months at this point. So outside my window, I see the border between the District of Columbia and the state of Maryland. So I live right on the border. And if I were strong enough, I could probably throw a tennis ball from my front door into the state of Maryland. So I have two young daughters, six and four, and we like to walk along the sidewalk and joke which side of the street we're on depends on which jurisdiction we're in. So maybe that's a lawyer's kid joke. So I am looking at the state of Maryland. I'm also looking at some beautiful snow that is sitting on my roof. We've had a ton of snow for DC in the last couple of weeks, which has 
also kept my children with great joy and their parents a little less time for work. But that's what I'm looking at. Very nice. So very interesting from a legal perspective and nice as well for the listeners to kind of picture where you are. So Jonah's in the snowy Washington, (laughs) D.C. I absolutely love that question. I'm going to have to take that one. That's great. Go for it. Go for it. So Jonah, so today we're going to look a little bit at legal writing, but from the persuasive side, so persuasive Mm -hmm. legal writing. And so we'll kind of get into that. But I wanted to ask you, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are today? Sure. I went to Georgetown uh, Law School about, let's say I graduated about 12 years ago at this point. And immediately after law school, I worked at a law firm here in Washington, D.C. called Williams and Connolly. It's a litigation only law firm, uh, a unicorn in today's American legal market in that it has only one office here in Washington, D.C. And despite now having over 200 attorneys, it sort of treats itself like its founding when it was just a couple of attorneys downtown. And the firm was dedicated 100% to doing litigation and doing litigation that either would touch court or likely would touch court. So I worked there for a year and then I had the opportunity to clerk for two incredible judges. So first on the district court here in Washington, D.C. So uh, for listeners who aren't as familiar with the sort of U.S. federal legal system, the district court is our trial court. There are 94 districts across the country and the District of Columbia, despite being a small place and my sort of hometown, has its own district. So I worked for Judge Ellen Huvel for a year as her term law clerk. So myself and one other person, we were there for a year and we basically... I like to joke we were the the judge's right hand and the judge's brain. That was our job. And it was an incredible experience. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Then I moved up to New York City for a year um, and clerked on the Court of Appeals. So on the Second Circuit, which includes the state and of New York and New York City, and again, got to work for a judge, but doing appeals work. So very uh, similar job title, but pretty different days. And after that, I went back to Williams and Connolly, where I practiced for almost three more years. I took a nine-month gap. I like to talk about this because I think it's important for especially men to hear this, but everybody to hear this. I took a nine-month gap. We had our oldest child. My wife, who's also a lawyer, had a fellowship that was quite busy. And so I took a self-made paternity leave before I went back to the firm and spent nine months at home with uh, my older daughter, which was incredible. And was at the firm. I worked on a bunch of different cases, mostly international and domestic civil litigation. So I was dealing with cases that were in the United States, but had some sort of international component. My biggest case was one that had a case in Missouri, uh, which is a state in the Midwest, in the United States, as well as active cases, uh, active litigation in both Manila and Mumbai. So it was quite a cool experience to be working on a case that sort of touched lots of jurisdictions. But I always had this idea that I might want to teach. I had got a master's degree before law school in religious studies, which was also my undergraduate major. I love to write. I love to think. And most of all, I love to be in front of a classroom of students. So I was lucky enough to get that opportunity to teach while I was a practitioner as an adjunct professor in the evening. And I loved it so much. You know, I joke with people that I didn't leave the law firm because I was particularly bad at it. I think I was okay at it. I left because I found my vocation in teaching. The challenge then is getting a teaching job and getting a teaching job. I don't know what it's like in other places, but in the United States in the legal market, especially in the city that you have life in is very challenging. And I was very lucky um, to be able to go back to my alma mater uh, and teach at Georgetown first as a visitor. And now I'm a full-time professor of legal practice. So that means I teach the first year students primarily. I do teach some advanced classes, but primarily first year students, how to research, how to write how to communicate orally. We do oral argument. We do some professionalism. And I get to do that every single day. So uh, I'm about to start my, let's see, it'll be my eighth semester teaching tomorrow. So I'm very excited. Oh, wow. You're going back tomorrow. (laughs) Yes, yes. It's good to be back. I'm lucky that, you know, my students I get to have for a full year. So they come in and they know absolutely uh, nothing. But they're so, so excited about becoming lawyers. And Whereas in their other classes, they're learning how to think like a lawyer and how to understand a particular area of doctrine. What I try to provide them is a set of skills 
that will help them along the way in no matter what legal career they find, and candidly in their other classes as well. The challenge, which I tell them on the first day and all the time, is I basically get 40 hours of class instruction over the course of the year with them which means I get one work week with them and I have to train them how to write like a lawyer, how to research like a lawyer, how to advocate, how to uh, you know, teach others. It's a lot in a small package. And so we try to do the best we can to provide that introduction. Yes. And so you mentioned a few things there that I want to talk about. We'll come sure. back to this, you know, that you're teaching them so much in so little time. I had a couple of questions. First of all, do you have international students on the course as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do not teach in our LLM program. We have a separate set of faculty that teach similar classes to the ones I do, but geared toward lawyers with an international focus or lawyers who have been trained as lawyers internationally. That said, there has been a big change, at least one that I've seen in my decade poking around Georgetown Law, of international students in our JD program, in our three-year American terminal law degree program. And so that means that every single year at this point, I have had several students who are coming from international backgrounds, and I think those numbers are growing. You might be thinking, why? I, I don't know the answer to that, although I do think it's becoming a credential that is respected abroad, even if you plan to practice not in the United States. I also think it's a product of the internationalization of big law firms. If you're at a law firm in your home country that is either based in the United States or has a presence in the United States, you play an incredible role. Something I like to talk about with my students is finding their personal monopoly. What is the thing that they can do better than anybody else? And you're never going to have your personal monopoly be like legal writing, right? I'm never going to be the best legal writer on the planet, but I might be the best legal writer on the planet who is from. Uh, I don't know, I have a student from Italy who has an American JD from Georgetown who also grew up in the suburbs of Milan, right? That is a much narrower sort of strength. And I think the international JD is becoming a credential that's being desired and accepted across the world. So it's been fascinating. Last year, due to the pandemic, I actually had seven students. They put all of the students studying in other time zones in my section. So I had seven students taking my class live on Zoom in either China or Korea. That was a huge change. And they were taking it in the middle of the night on top of everything else. So yes, uh, I do teach some international students, but I teach them as if they're studying to get an American law degree to practice in the United States, because that's what I teach. Okay, great. And you mentioned a couple of things there that I found very interesting. You mentioned that you worked as a clerk. Mm -hmm. And for listeners, clerk is like an assistant to a judge. They help with many different aspects. You mentioned that you took paternity leave, which is I, great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'll just add before we move on uh, on being a law clerk, you know, I know that term is used differently across the world. The role of law clerk in the American legal system is incredibly important. There are different models for it. Some particularly state courts, but also some federal courts, judges use career clerks, people who play this role over the course of many years. But at least in the federal system, many judges hire new clerks every single year. And they're usually recent graduates. So I had practiced for a year. Some people have practiced for a few more years, but it's usually either new or very recent graduates. And you play every role that the judge lets you. And it's not just administrative. I think people sometimes hear the word clerk and they think, oh, so you're taking dictation and, and dealing with the judge's calendar. It is an incredibly substantive role. You are often the first set of eyes and the first draft of anything that comes out of chambers. And it's the only way that you can get the volume of work done that a federal judge has to get done. And so if you want to be a litigator or do international arbitration or anything where someone is going to be judging uh, you and deciding, is your case compelling? Being on the other side and playing that role of judge's brain right at the beginning of your career is an absolute superpower game changer. 
thank you for adding that in to explain it a bit more. And I noticed your pronunciation in American, you pronounce it clerk. And in the British, we pronounce it Clark. Clark, right. So <laughs> listeners might be thinking, are they talking about the same thing? Yes, we are. Yes, we um, are. <laughs> and so paternity leave for listeners, you know, you have maternity leave, which is when a woman has a baby and she takes off time. Equally, we have paternity leave, which is where the man takes time off to also look after the baby and have time off time with the child. Yeah. So, it, it, and the term that is getting used more commonly is just parental leave, right? That's something that I think particularly, you know, American businesses, but my area is law firms, that law firms are really thinking critically about. Law firms are often the last to change. They tend to be somewhat conservative institutions, just slow to change. And maternity leave has, you know, been a big part of the law firm world and it's well established. And as our society changes and recognizes that it's important for fathers who are given the opportunity, are able to, and want to have that opportunity. And my view is if you are able to have that opportunity, you should absolutely take it. You should want it even if you're not sure if you want it. We're having a real conversation about what that looks like. And at my law firm, that meant I took some time before I came back. When we had our second child, it meant I took some paid time, but it was significantly less than were provided to mothers. Many law firms in the United States have actually moved to set uh, parental leave models that have the same number of weeks for the mother or the father. So we're having those discussions and it's really important. And, and candidly, the United States, from what I understand, is probably one of the furthest back in terms of providing leave as a country, but businesses are really critically thinking as their employees ask for it and demand it in the marketplace, how can we support that? And as a member of a two lawyer, two working parent family, I believe it's my role in my family also to be an active father. It's a little bit different than the world um, 50 years ago. Mm. Yeah, parental leave, I guess, is a m much more inclusive term. Probably in the future, I imagine that both maternity and paternity leave will evolve into p just us calling it parental leave. So you mentioned that you, when you were talking about working in big law as a civil mm -hmm. litigator, you mentioned that you had the opportunity to work on some interesting cases that involved international aspects. Sure. Are you, are you able to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, I can talk at a high level. So one of the things that I saw when I started as a civil litigator, so my firm did a lot of criminal work, but I was focused primarily on civil litigation, which is at least in the United States is a nice way of saying businesses suing other businesses or people suing other people. As businesses become more global, by definition, so do their lawsuits, right? And so the case that I was mentioning that I spent a lot of time on over the course of several years was a case of two US-based companies, big sort of internet data providers in the exact same space. They were competitors. They were both based in the United States. So you might think, what's international about that, right? The data they were talking about was all US data. It became an international case because the company that I was working for that was the plaintiff in the case was alleging that as part of the data theft, the competitor was using foreign workers, specifically in India and the Philippines, to basically go online and manually scrape my client's data. And at that point, this case between two American companies becomes an international case, right? We had to go out and try to get discovery, get information about what happened, documents, interviews, the data itself from these foreign countries because that's where it was scraped. That's where it was taken from. And there are ways to do that sort of through an American case. I'm not an expert on it, but there are ways to sort of get discovery from abroad through a U.S. case. What my client and my firm did is we actually filed cases abroad to get this information. So we filed cases in Manila and in Mumbai alleging that these contractors were taking our client's data and we had technical evidence to sort of show the court that we we weren't just making this up. We had a reason to a good reason to believe this and we filed cases in those jurisdictions. And so that meant we were off to the races 
in those foreign countries, and they were running simultaneous with our United States case. And we had to have local counsel in those countries who were guiding us because the the local case law was different, the local approach, the writing was different. You know, when I was a junior sort of mid-level associate, I was in charge of managing the administrative pieces of this case. And it meant that we would often here in Washington have a conference call with the Philippines at about 7 a.m. here. Then we'd work our full day on our American case. And then on the way out at about 7 p.m. or even later, we'd have a conference call with our lawyers in India. And that was the only way that we could connect all of this. So much so that our foreign lawyers in the Philippines, when things got really heavy and we were drafting lots of documents, they asked one of their associates to work U.S. hours for the duration of the drafting process so that we could have someone that we could communicate with during our workday. And then they, on their way out, could communicate what needed to happen overnight. It was a very challenging six months for sure to sort of live all these different clocks. But it is an example that I think more and more litigation, as we become a more global society, even a U.S. case of two U.S. companies about U.S. data has an international component and needs international lawyers on our teams. That's such an interesting case. Thank you. I'm going to try to do a bit of a recap about it. So sure. you were representing the plaintiff. Listeners will know that plaintiff in the US is claimant in England. So you were representing the plaintiff who was a US company that Correct. was alleging that they had data stolen by another company, a competitor. Correct. But that competitor had contracted companies, other companies or other contractors yeah, from contractors the, from the Philippines from India and so not only did you have to file a case against the competitor you also had to file cases in the Philippines and also in India or just and in India the- yes we filed civil uh, cases in both jurisdictions as you said against the contractors of our US based competitor it sounds like an incredibly interesting and complex case and you mentioned that you had to do all of the filing all together. What kind of documents did you have to provide? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's start with the US case. That's because that's what I know a lot about having been on the judge side of it, working for judges, having been on the lawyer side of it, and now trying to teach it to students. But as the plaintiff, we filed something called a complaint. Uh, A complaint is the first document in any civil litigation uh, we filed in federal court, but the same is true in state court. And basically the complaint, the rules say it is a, quote, short and plain statement, end quote, of your allegations. And it's basically the way of starting the case and saying, here's our theory. Here's how we were wronged, allegedly, right? You have to to prove anything in your complaint. And here's the, the evidence that we have so far. And here's why we should be able to get further evidence and and sort of move forward. Our complaint in this particular case was quite detailed. Complaints historically have not had to be very detailed. And the reason makes sense, right? If you're making an allegation against someone and saying, I need to take evidence to prove my point, it would be impossible for you to get that evidence before you start the case. However, at least in technical or technological cases, we can get a lot of information before we file the complaint. So for example, we had data from our servers, from my client's servers that said these folks were on from this country at this time. We don't know exactly who they are, but we know that this was their IP address, their internet marker, and this is the country from which they were coming. So that's something we would put in the complaint as part of our general allegation. And you sort of give a theory of your case. Now, it may turn out your theory of the case is wrong. That's fine. That's what the litigation process is supposed to find out. You can't file a complaint that's made up or pure guess. We have civil rules and ethical rules that make sure that we at least have something to make our theory, but sometimes the theory of the case is wrong. The other thing a complaint does is it just tells your story right? It's the first time the other side gets to hear your story. It's the first time the judge is going to get to see your story. And all of the subsequent materials, all of the depositions, so a deposition is just an interview under oath of another person. So all of the depositions are going to be sort of cabined 
to the allegations in your complaint. So it's very it's a very important document. And so in the United States, we built a case and we mostly built that case with information we found on the internet, information from our servers. Some of it dealt with copyrighted photography. And so the way we made that claim is we said, here's our picture that we own the copyright to, and here's the information about the copyright. And here's the picture on our competitor's database, and they're exactly the same. So that story is not particularly challenging to tell, but what was interesting from my perspective, I'm really interested in the visual components of legal advocacy, and we actually used a lot of images in the complaint document itself. So we didn't just say, this photo of this particular spot was taken. Instead, we said, here is the photo on our database and showed a picture, and here's a photo on our competitor's database and showed a picture, and we let the pictures tell the story, which was really interesting and I think something that's becoming more common. In the other countries, those documents that started the case looked totally different and were completely outside of my scope of knowledge and remain outside my scope of knowledge. That's why you have to get the best lawyers in whatever jurisdiction you're working. That's really, really interesting. You made many interesting points there that I want to mention. So first of all, you mentioned how for the US case, you filed the complaint and that set out your story basically about what you were alleging. It didn't contain evidence proving it, but you presented some pictures and things to show we're alleging that they stole the image Mm -hmm. basically and you provided the image on your site and the image from their site. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting, right? You think of evidence as something you get after you file the complaint. The complaint is what lets you take evidence or find evidence. But it is, I will say, it is becoming, as evidence is more easy to find in some of these cases, pre-complaint, you can include more evidence in your complaint. The other side may say, well, you have an incomplete picture, but it's definitely making complaints more detailed. And I guess I'd be remiss to mention the other reason you include more in complaints in the United States is we actually had a big Supreme Court case sort of, I think it was, I don't want to get the year wrong, I think 2007 and maybe 2009, two Supreme Court cases that basically said you need to allege more. That there, for 50 years, the base case for a complaint to pass that initial threshold was quite low. And the Supreme Court in two cases, sort of at the end of the the first decade of the 2000s, said, actually, the rules require something greater than that. And as a response, lawyers have now had to do a lot more work in their complaints to tell stories that have a little more detail, a little more factual allegation to survive that first motion, which we call a motion to dismiss, which says, even if you agree with everything in this document, there's no legal case there. And so that's probably more than your listeners needed to know. But the idea that complaints have changed, I think, is a real one as a result of that law change. That's very interesting because the complaint, like in England, we'd call that the claim form and the particulars of claim. Together, they make up the statement of case and they set out the story. And I think in England, we tend not to include evidence in that, Mm, but rather separately. So it's interesting to hear that actually there's a move towards including evidence in the US. Especially in these big business cases, right? I think the audience for complaints has changed a little bit. I think originally the audience was just the opposing party. It was a way of saying, here's what we've got and here's what we're going to fight about. And now complaints are public documents and your competitors will see them. The news media will see them. Complaints have a much larger audience than just the other party and the court itself. Wow. Where can listeners find some examples of complaints? Yeah. So in the federal system, there's a an online system. It's called PACER, P-A-C-E-R. I, I will say it is not the most advanced system and it is actually quite expensive. So even though it's a government database and they're public documents, you pay by the page. But once someone's paid for it, it is a public document and they can post it. So if you Google Any complaint name from any big case, chances are a journalist has posted it. I'm thinking of some sort of high profile cases in the wake of the most recent presidential election, for example. Some of the manufacturers of voting equipment sued for defamation, Rudy Giuliani and a few other sort of big players in the US political system for 
basically defaming their machines. That complaint, I'm sure, is out there on the internet somewhere. But yeah, they are public documents. They are filed with the court. But immediately when the court accepts them as filed, they go into this public system that anyone has access to. The only sort of exception to that is if you file a specific motion saying some information in the complaint needs to be sealed. And there are a bunch of rules about what can and can't be sealed. So that could be national security, trade secrets is a common one. But by and large, these complaints are public documents. Doesn't mean that the public is reading all of them, but if they wanted to, just like a U.S. courtroom is open to the public, unless it's not, the U.S. written word in court is also open to the public, unless it's not. In England, generally, the judgments are public documents, but the lawyers' documents are generally not published. And so that's a great resource. Yeah, that's a big big difference. It's a big difference. You know, the default is that all of these documents, all the lawyers' documents, are public. Often the evidence that is attached to these documents can sometimes be sealed for various reasons, or the parties can agree sort of in a pretrial motion that they're going to seal certain information. But the default is public information. Great. And you mentioned that, so when you're filing the complaint, the complaint contains the theory of case. You mentioned Mm -hmm. the theory of case. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is? It's interesting because, you know, Uh, Since I've been on the academic side for a few years full time, sometimes I I think of these things as the way I teach them. I'm going to be teaching theory of the case in a couple of days in my persuasive writing class with my first years. But the theory of the case, as I teach it or as I think about it, sort of at base is why is your side right? And sometimes your side is right in terms of the law, (laughs) right? Sometimes you have the law on your side. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have the facts on your side. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have both on your side. Sometimes you have neither. There's a famous story that is told about the founding partner of my law firm, although I've heard it told in the name of other famous lawyers, so I don't know if it's just him. But Edward Bennett Williams used to say, if the law's on your side, hammer the law. If the facts are on the side, hammer the facts. If neither's on your side, hammer the table and speak as loudly as you possibly can. And so your theory of the case is how and why are you going to win? And the way we teach it to our first year students who have never experienced it is what is the one sentence of the case that shows why you win? Now, it's often hard to tell a whole theory of the case in one sentence, just like you can't tell the story of a book in a single sentence, but it's your thesis. Sometimes the theory of your case could be about the policy behind it, that the law needs to change because X. The other way we teach theory of the case is we ask our students at the beginning, right when they've received their fact pattern, their hypothetical, so we don't give them a real case, we give them one that's sort of made up, and they research the law, and we ask them to draw a picture of why they're going to win. And law students who often are not artists, that's why they went to law school, look at us like we're crazy. But if you had to draw a picture of why you're going to win, that's the theory of your case. Are you able to give an example of sure. like a one sentence? Yeah, that's a challenge, but I'll try. So, <laughs> so we spent so much time talking about my favorite case from practice, you know, based on the complaint, right? I would define the theory of that case to be my client's largest competitor was making money and trying to prove its success on the back of the copyrighted materials and protected trade secret materials that my client spent years and millions of dollars creating. That's the theory. The theory is you have done something wrong to me that the law recognizes. We have spent time and money and a lot of it building this big, beautiful database that people pay a fair amount of money to use, and you've taken it using foreign contractors and technological means, right? The complaint was about 80 pages. That's the theory of the case. Yeah. So a nice, short, to the point, clear statement about Mm -hmm. why you should win. Mm Mm-hmm. Does the defendant have to do that as well or not? 
Oh, I think the defendant often, sh yeah, I mean, I think the defendant should also have a theory of the case, right? The defendant in the case that I was just talking about, their theory of the case in response might be something like all of the information that is included in this database is publicly available and the pictures were provided by our clients, which does not violate copyright, right? Both of those things can be true. And that's what the litigation is going to be about. So it, there's no place in a legal document where you say, my theory of the case is, right? You're never showing that. But that's your like driving force, right? Like I'm a podcaster, you're a podcaster. When people ask us, what is our podcast about, right? We can give them sort of a canned two sentence version of why we do what we do and what we do. That's the same thing. That's the theory of the case. And the reason I think it's so important is if you don't know what the theory of the case is, then you often make poor choices about how you deal with specific problems. So if you have a theory of the case or too many theories of your case, your complaint is not going to be easy to follow by your audience, by the judge, and by the other side. The theory of the case helps narrow and focus your argument. That's great. So you gave two theories of cases there, one for the plaintiff, one for the defendant. I felt persuaded by both of those. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of entering the realm into persuasiveness. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, what is persuasive writing? So I'm grateful to the folks who have been teaching legal writing as an academic discipline for the last several decades it didn't exist in any sort of meaningful way 30 or 40 years ago. So we're still pretty new to this discipline of legal writing as an academic rhetorical genre. And one of the things that I've learned from these experts is sort of talking about two types of writing. We have predictive legal writing and we have persuasive legal writing. Predictive legal writing asks the question or the purpose of predictive legal writing is what is the likely outcome, right? So a client comes into your office and says, here's what happened. Under the current law, what are my chances? That's predictive writing. Persuasive writing doesn't have a likely answer. It is how can we argue that the answer is the one that is best for us, right? So as a litigator, as someone who practiced in courts, I would almost always start conversations with clients or the partners I worked for would start conversations with clients in a predictive stance, right? They would say, here's what we think our competitor's doing. Should we sue them? Is this worth it financially, from a business perspective, from a legal perspective? And when they say we are going to, we turn around 180 degrees and move to persuading a judge that our theory of the case and our evidence is right. So persuasive writing, the purpose of it is to convince someone that the answer you think is the answer is the actual answer. And so in my legal writing class, and I think this is true for many US legal writing classes, you spend that first semester learning how to convey prediction because that's kind of a keystone. You know, The US system is based on this idea that like cases are decided alike, stare decisis, sort of the common law concept. And then once we've done that, we then move those same students to make persuasive arguments for their side, why under the current law, the outcome that they want is right. Predictive writing is hard because you have to figure out what the quote unquote right answer is. Persuasive writing is hard because you already know the answer. It's whatever your client needs the answer to be and you have to work backwards to get there. So they're challenging just in different ways. Thank you. So this is a big question. What are some of the key elements in persuasive writing? Hmm. Yeah, so so I, you know I'm introducing the concepts tomorrow in class, the first class of the spring, and, and I think the way to think about it is with classical rhetoric. There is this idea of the three pillars of classical rhetoric, and I'm not going to bore anybody, but are pathos, logos, and ethos. So logos is this idea of logic. That's what we spend most of that predictive semester doing, right? Arguing by analogy, deducing answers, inducing rules. So. You can persuade with logic, 
right? This case is like that one that came out the same way as my clients did because. So that's one technique. Uh, a second technique is ethos, sort of your credibility. Does your story make sense? Is your writing clear? Are you citing the right sources of authority? Are we talking about the right law? So that's a second pillar. And then the third is pathos, this emotional argument. And that's the part that doesn't play a big role in the predictive writing, but plays a huge role in persuasive writing, which is, what's your story? Why should we care? Right? Persuasive writing and an appeal to pathos might be something like, well, judge, this case might seem like those two cases you saw last week, right? Logos. That's what the other side is saying. But if we extend the law to this new set of facts, right, then every single case under the sun is going to fall under this law. And you don't want that to happen because as a judge, you need to have some hard guidelines as to what cases are legal and what cases are illegal. And this is a case that goes too far. So logos, pathos, and ethos are sort of the three ways we think about how to persuade. And again, it comes down to what do you have at your disposal? Sometimes your best argument is going to be an appeal to logic, and sometimes the logic's going to go the other way. And so you have to make an appeal to story and emotion uh, and policy judgments and all of those things. So nice that you mentioned that. I think a lot of listeners, they watch kind of legal dramas and a lot of them are American and you see the lawyers in the courtroom. And I think one of those rhetorical elements that you mentioned there seems to be overplayed a little bit in some legal dramas, the appeal to emotion, people getting very emotional in the courtroom. What's your comment on that? It's a great question because I think legal dramas are a way that we find ourselves or, or you know, stories about law are a way we find ourselves thinking we want to be a lawyer or we might want to do it. I think you're absolutely right that popular culture displays of law, particularly of advocates, particularly in courtrooms, tend to rely almost exclusively on pathos, on emotion. And of course, it's overplayed. But that's because how could you make an appeal to logic when the audience hasn't read the case that you're citing? It would not be a very interesting courtroom drama to do analogical reasoning, to do reasoning by comparing one case to another case. Well, Your Honor, you know, Johnson v. Johnson compels this outcome. It's not going to be a very interesting television show. I think the challenge, especially after that first predictive semester, is sometimes people swing when they start law too far the other direction, and they just think of law as this emotionless, outcome-determined approach. And in reality, it's balancing all of these factors, which makes real law, in my view, more nuanced and more interesting, but not necessarily more interesting in a movie or on television. I've read a, a few books about advocacy and drafting mm -hmm. documents for courts here in, in England. So the books that I've got kind of talk from the British perspective, to have good advocacy, you have to remain very reasonable. Don't overdo it with lots of adjectives mm -hmm. and too much emotion. Yeah, what do you think it, about that? Yeah. You know, what I really like about that point is think of logos, pathos, or ethos. Think of them as dials, right? You have three dials and you can't turn all the dials to 100, right? You can't turn them all the way up. You can't be telling the terrible story of what happened while um, trying to be seen as the most honest lawyer of all time for your ethos while also making the logical argument. It doesn't work like that. As one dial goes up, another dial goes down. And I think ethos and pathos, your credibility and your persuasion, often one goes up while the other tends to go down. So if you go too far in your story or too far in your emotion or too far in your yelling, right, you're losing credibility. And so in order to maintain that credibility, you need to do that in much more subtle ways. But by the same token, if you completely ignore the emotional element to it, you're also going to lose credibility with the judge. It's going to feel detached. And so you kind of have to put these three pieces in balance. 
which is why we start teaching it in law school here and why in the British system where you have a much longer sort of vocational training, learning that balance takes a long time and a lot of cases and a lot of repetitions to make it work. Thank you. So you mentioned previously about the, the as a clerk, you worked in both the mm-hmm. trial and the appellate level. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. What What are the kind of differences there between them? Sure. So the trial court is where you start a civil or criminal case, right? It is where you are figuring out the facts, what happened, and the relevant law. And depending on what happens, that might go all the way to trial. That might be a trial before a judge. That could be a trial before a jury. Or the case might end sooner than that. You might file a motion and say, actually, we didn't find what we thought we found. The case is over. Regardless, the trial is the the fact-finding and the legal decision. But that's not the end of a case. At least in the American system, typically you have a right to appeal you know, there are limits to that, right? But you basically get to say, the court got it wrong. And your argument is that the court got it wrong legally, or failed to understand the facts as laid out, or failed to go look for the relevant facts. And so we call that in the federal system, the district court does the trial. And then at the end, at the very end, you don't appeal in the middle, you wait till the end of the case, whatever that looks like. The losing party can then get an appeals court judge to say, Did we get it wrong? And more importantly, how wrong did we get it? So we have these ideas of standards of review, which is a way of saying, even if the district court, the trial court, it was a 50-50 shot, could go either way. And the appeals court said, you know, on balance, I'd probably have gone the other way. There are certain standards of review where you would then win. And there are certain standards of review where the court would say, look, even though it feels like a close call, we trust that the judge who saw the witness in the box got it right. That's pretty abstract. So I'll just tell a super short story to sort of make it more concrete. When I was clerking, we were being trained and another judge came and gave a talk to all the clerks. And he was a trial court judge. And he said, Our job as trial court judges is to get the answer. He then paused and he said, the appeals court judge's job is to get the answer right. And the reason he said that is think about the sheer quantity of cases that are moving through the process. They just have to get to an answer. And the appeals court is kind of a check on that. And then in the federal system, the Supreme Court is then the check on the appeals court and they only check that which they choose to check. But that's the difference. And from the lawyer's perspective, like from your persuasive writing, again, this is a huge question, but what are the the kind of main differences between preparing for a trial compared Mm -hmm. to a case for appeal? Sure. I mean, it depends on the case, obviously. But I think, you know, if I was going to generalize, persuading a judge at the trial level often requires a lot more dealing with the facts. This is what happened therefore this outcome ought to occur. You know, there are some trial court decisions that are purely legal, but they're often fact-related. So when you're persuading, what you're really trying to tell the trial judge is, here are the relevant facts and here's why I should win. If you're trying to argue an appeal, and I was never truly an appellate lawyer, but I spent some time listening to really great appellate lawyers, what they're trying to argue is not the answer to the case but they're trying to show why the district court did something incorrect. And it sounds really procedural, but it's not. It's often that this is not what the law either demands or intends. And so your argument to a trial judge is trying to just say, here, I have enough facts. And your argument to the court of appeals judge is to try to get it right. Make sure the law is right. The reality is most appeals are pretty easy and most appeals end up losing, right? Most appeals, the trial court got it right. Trial court judges in the federal system and in the state system are often very good, but it's finding that 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever it is, where something went wrong. And so your persuasion is a little different. The other way that appellate advocacy is different than trial court advocacy is sometimes in appellate advocacy, you're arguing for the law to change, right? And so 
the trial court judge can't say, well, I'm not going to follow this case. An appeals court can say, the case that you're telling me to follow is now wrong for whatever reason. And if you go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, they can completely change their own law. And so appellate advocacy, you're not just thinking what went wrong, but how might we argue for the law to change in a way that's beneficial to our client? And so those are the different challenges. Mm, Yes. And so finally, I wanted to ask you what resources you recommend, because obviously we've just touched on this huge Mm -hmm. topic today of advocacy and persuasive writing. What resources do you recommend for listeners to learn a bit more about these topics? Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. I mean, it's a whole academic discipline of how do you argue, but I'll give some sort of high level thoughts. First of all, when you're looking for resources, ask yourself specifically, what am I really looking for? Do I want to know more about the trial advocacy process? Do I want to know more about legal writing as done in the United States? Do I want to learn about persuasion or legal storytelling? There's great resources out there for all of that. One starting place, the sort of national group of professors that teach what I teach is called the Legal Writing Institute, LWI. If you Google LWI, it's one of the first things that will come up. And LWI collects articles that have been written by professors about all of these topics into a couple of different journals that we tend to write in. And they've even prepared something, and I'm sure most people don't know about this, something they call their monograph series, where they pull articles in by topic. So they just created a monograph on social justice writing, for example, or they might have one on persuasion, or they might have one on prediction or the basics of legal writing. So check out the LWI monographs because it'll collect the best of this crazy amount of articles. The second set of resources I recommend are books that are more popular. One author that comes to mind is uh, a guy named Ross Guberman, G-U-B-E-R-M-A-N. And he's written a couple of books that try to compile examples of effective legal writing. So he has one book that's focused on brief writing and one book that's focused on judges' opinions. And it pulls excerpts into clear buckets. And I think his books are pretty good. A little bit less academic, but quite good. And then the last thing I would say is and we talked a little bit about this earlier, is a lot of this legal writing is public and out there. It's just a matter of getting it in front of your nose. And so one way to do that, I'm pretty active on uh, Twitter. And Twitter is a great place. Uh, It's a great place to get lost, so be careful. But it's also a great place to connect to lawyers who put forward good legal writing and talk about legal writing. The hashtag in the United States where sort of legal writing nerds hang out is hashtag appellate Twitter. And that's a great place to see what are people who do this for a vocation, either academics or practitioners, talking about. So those are the three places I'd start. I guess I should give a plug to my own podcast, How I Lawyer, where I interview lawyers about what they do, why they do it, and how they do it well. And we talk a lot about legal writing, a lot about legal thinking, and legal careers there too. So howilawyer.com. And yeah, that's a good start. Fantastic. Thank you. Interesting that you mention the hashtag appellate Twitter because one of my previous guests mentioned this. So oh, good. Um, hopefully the listeners are going to be following that hashtag and your own Twitter, which is at Jonah Perlin. So do listeners follow Jonah on Twitter because he also posts loads of interesting content. And I know that some of the listeners already listen to your podcast. So some of them are definitely familiar with it. But if you are not listeners, then definitely go and listen to Jonah's podcast, How I Lawyer. How Um, I Lawyer. I appreciate the plug. Thank you so much. Because yeah, it's super interesting to hear different stories, different people who work in different areas of law and there's loads of vocabulary in there for learning about legal careers and what people do basically so it's another great legal podcast to listen to so thank you thank you Jonah it's been brilliant yeah it's been my absolute pleasure it's really fun being on the other side of the microphone a little bit petrifying but really fun nonetheless we'll have to find a way to get you on how i lawyer and turn the tables but this has been great <laughs> yeah and if any listeners you know out there listen to this and have other ideas or, or want to continue the conversation one of the great parts about 
being an academic and being at a place like Georgetown is I really do try to connect with as many people uh, as you can. So as you said, you can find me on Twitter at Jonah Perlin. You can look up my Georgetown email address, which is on the internet too, and uh, let me know. Great. I see that you're on LinkedIn as well. Do you use LinkedIn a little bit? I do. And I'm trying to get more into it for the podcast because I think that's where some practitioners tend to hang out. I still haven't figured out the algorithm or how to surface good content. But uh, yes, I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I'm the only Jonah Perlin there. You can find me there as well. Great. So listeners, if you've got any questions, any comments, do get in touch with Jonah. You can find him on LinkedIn, Twitter, J-O-N-A-H-P-E-R. L-I-N. You got it. (laughs) On Twitter, on LinkedIn, and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to get back to you with some great answers to any of your questions. Great. So that's the end of this episode. I hope you found it useful and learned something new. If you don't know Jonah's podcast, do check it out at www.howilawyer.com. Connect with Jonah Perlin on LinkedIn or Twitter. His handle is at Jonah Perlin. Any links mentioned in the show are in the show notes, and you can also find them by heading over to studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 117. So thanks for listening and see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Study Legal English podcast. If you really want to get ahead, why not become a member and gain access to many learning resources? Visit studylegalenglish.com forward slash pricing.